Hello and welcome to Court Games, a Legend of the Five Rings podcast, funded by the Legend of the Five Rings Discord Community Patreon. This podcast will focus on the role-playing game stories and lore for Legend of the Five Rings. I'm Korva. I'm Kikita Kaori. And uh, today we're going to do a podcast on some of the situations around one would use dueling for, and just talking about dueling. We're going to be a little casual about it and not get all mechanical. Yeah. Mechanical is going to be a whole thing. Whole capital thing. Capital letter thing, definitely. Um, And I've noticed that some people do have some questions about the mechanics and... uh, we will look into, I, mean, I don't know how comprehensive we can be because there's a lot to it, but this is mainly about how crops from the stories and how you might use it in a game and stuff like that. And the, the lore and stuff around dueling. Right. So we'll just kind of freely talk about this. We do have a little news this week though, don't we? We do. First off, uh, somewhat to my surprise, it's not somewhere I'd, I'd expect to see an article on, on Legend of Five Rings, but there is a Forbes article on the upcoming Adventures in Rockigan publication, and that's the one that is going to bring the world of Legend of Five Rings to Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. Mm-hmm. And so there is some discussion on the history of L5R and, and all things like that, and that was uh, quite an interesting little article to read. Yep. There's also a YouTube promotional video and an article on Tech Raptor. We'll have links for that those articles in our show notes. This is all part of the marketing push for Adventures in Rokugan, which is being released August 5th in conjunction with uh, Gen Con. So that's where you can go get it. Yep, we have an actual release date, which is nice. So that's the news for, for this week. And let's have a look at our topic for this episode, which is, as I said, dueling. And the obvious to start off with, you know, what is a duel? And in Less of the Five Rings, at least, it is any one-on-one combat where effectively the camera is focused in on those two individual combatants. Right. So there is a technical set of rules associated with dueling. But they don't have to be worked like that. But it it is combat. It's one-on-one. It's not for group without other people interfering. But the circumstances that it can occur in can be very, very broad. And you can use those dueling rules for a lot more than you might actually think. So I hoped maybe we could talk about, uh, you know, when, when would you go ahead and use use dueling, use the dueling rules. But before that, maybe I, I want to talk about a little bit why we have dueling as a thing in L5R. And I'm going to accede to your expertise here because dueling is all about cinema and you are the Japanese cinema <laughs> on the team. And that's really what dueling is about. This isn't something that was particularly historical. It was, it's about movies. I mean, yes and no, yes and no. But I mean, it must be said, the classical Legend of Five Rings duel is its own thing in a way. Dueling as a part of samurai cinema is every bit as much as important as the Wild West cowboy shootout in Western films. Mm-hmm. And I suppose they're approximately as historical, I guess. It must be said that there are historical figures like Miyamoto Musashi who gained his reputation, the reason we know that guy's name, apart from the Book of Five Rings, which he wrote, is that he had a reputation for dueling. He participated in a number of duels in the very early Edo period and didn't die, which I think is a prerequisite to, to being famous. And like, like his most famous thing is a duel that he took part in and all that kind of thing. So it's not completely a historical, but yeah, it's very much a cinematic thing. And that very dramatic thing where the, where the, the two samurai are staring at each other and yeah, the music's going and the tension ramps up and ramps up and ramps up until suddenly there's a flurry of violence and one of them, they both stand there for ages and one of them falls over. <laughs> that ends up being the loser. And and that's 
that kind of duel or, or that way of dueling that that we think about it for L five R is about recreating these these movies from cinema. Now, yeah. the real real life kind of dueling, what we call dueling, is uh, I'm sure that there's lots of explanations that they've called it over the history, but I'm going to call it out as a uh, bravery demonstration. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you you can't back down. Right. It's not really for conflict resolution historically. No. I mean, it's done in a conflict, but the whole point of it was that courage is a social premium. It's 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 how you demonstrate your worth as a soldier to your lord. This is how I'm earning my cha- paycheck because I'm. I'm brave. I can do these things. And that gets broadened out in a warrior society or even a society that had aspirations of being a warrior society at one point long before, but now is a bunch of proper gentlemen with pistols at dawn. Um, yes. You know, <laughs> it, it starts out as a demonstration of your worth to your Lord because you have courage and skill in combat. Yeah, it can be that, and it can also be, they, they say that an armed society is a polite society, because, you know, if someone insults you, it's very common to want to hit them. And if everyone's wandering around with weapons, that can be a problem. And and so when you combine those two things, you combine the, I must demonstrate that I'm brave, or I am worthless, and how dare that person say that thing about my mother, if you don't have a formalized way of arranging these things, then there's just going to be brawls and there's going to be blood feuds and there's going to be chaos. Well, there's one other element that goes into into the dueling, and that is when the definition of masculinity becomes tied up with the definition of being a warrior, Yeah, then... It becomes how you prove you are a man, basically. <laughs> to use a non-samurai analog, it is very common to make links between samurai films and Western films. And there's a lot of links between them in all sorts of interesting ways. But, but even, even in those societies, in, in that society as written, when they're not actually soldiers, they're just, you know, cowboys or people who live in town or whatever. You cannot be seen to be a coward. You cannot be seen to back down. And you you cannot abide an insult. And there are specific things people cannot say about you or your family. And if they if they do and they don't apologize, and if then it can end up with shooting. This has very much been part of a lot of societies. And and I guess what the reason I bring up the whole the, using the Western analogy is really good. Um because it is perfectly possible that your cowboy is rumbling and throwing punches in the saloon all afternoon long, and they're fighting, but it hasn't switched to a duel yet. The duel yes. happens when something particular has been called out that says, you are not a real man. <laughs> mm. Frankly, you know, it's not like you're not a real cowboy. They they go straight for the the masculinity and that and that if you accept this insult or you don't, you know, call it call it out through having a shootout. And it's the same way translated into, you know, samurai dueling. It it's it's this definition of same idea, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. why um, not everybody has to – there's a certain social cachet to it. You know, you have to be above the lowest class for dueling, you know, for it to count, I guess, because if you're the lowest class, then you don't have any status to stand on, really, <laughs> to defend through that fashion. So it is a combination of, at certain points, if you are to to hold up your part of the social contract, as it were, <laughs> uh, you have to resort to violence. You know, violence is how you fix this problem. 
But at the same time, society is going, well, okay, sure, fine, but we're going to draw some boundaries. So it, it must happen in this way. Like, you can't just draw a gun and shoot someone because that's murder. But if you, if you say, right, go, you go for your gun, we're going to both go for our guns, and then it's a fair fight, then it's fine. Which, honestly, I think to a lot of modern people, if you, someone tried that in a real-world court, you, that's insane, you know? Mm -hmm. Today, it's crazy because we don't do that anymore. But in, a, in certain circumstances like that, it does make sense. Even, so you can even end up with situations like, I am an officer of the law and you're a criminal, and yet we should still do the formal dual thing to demonstrate that we're not savages. Mm. Yeah, so it, it's it's interesting kind of, it, yeah, it's, it's an intersection between violence but also control. So that's kind of talking about dueling broadly. Uh, as best as best we can, but in L five R, the role playing game, dueling isn't just that. It can be many kinds of one on one fight. It is that too. Yes, but it can be many. It can be many things. Even and even even if it is that that we've been talking about, it could be it could be have many forms even there. So there's a lot of possibilities. So that leads to different types types of duels. The first kind of duel, the the most classic kind of duel that we talk about, um, is a formal iujitsu duel that is arranged, you know, weeks in advance with a little audience and in a scenic location. It's all public, and there's rules about it. And can be done for deciding the truth of something. We'll talk about judicial duels in a minute. But it's often because you have insulted me in some fashion. And this is my formal redress. This is where we show all the world that we have resolved this through a duel. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not just going to walk up and punch you. I'm not going to just walk up and stab you. I'm not going to say, okay, lads, we're going to murder them and their entire family, like what we would do if we weren't civilized people. I'm going to be very civilized. And I'm going to send a note to your superior saying, can I please murder your subordinates for the following reasons? And they're going to say, yes, <laughs> you, know, I mean, you know, that kind of thing. It's going to be very formal. But yes, it's how dare you, swords at dawn. Right. That kind of duel is actually much more tricky to integrate into a campaign. It's very much the highlight of a, a campaign. Things can build up to that kind of duel, but because of the time in advance that it takes and the preparation and just the level of formality of it, uh, even though that is classic and you have, you know, the Kikita rules for it and everything. Yeah, as as a story, as a story, it's, it's great. Story, it's great. It's just hard to integrate in the campaign. That's your climax, and that's that's a formal event, like in the future. That's arranged, and there's a whole path of many things to set up for that, and a whole bunch of things around it. And often, that might be your campaign might because campaigns because players are spontaneous; they don't tend to work on those level plans. That formal duel could be between two NPCs, and you are working around them. We are used to, as players, going, this is my intention, and either being told, here's what happens, or roll some dice. We're not used to, this is my intention, right, okay, now make a roll to write a nice note to your daimyo, and we'll sort this out, and the fight will be happening three sessions from now. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it is a little unusual in that sense, that you would, you would kind of want to build it up and build it up like that. which. Uh, mm -hmm. So. Just just kind of extending that thing. Um, if you have a, a giri uh, that you will duel this enemy of your family. Okay, so and so killed my father, and I am going to duel him. That's my that's my thing. That's that's me as a character. That could be a formal duel. That's the culmination of an entire campaign. So you can start the campaign going, all right, how am I going to follow this? Well, first, I've got to learn everything about them. 
And then I've got to get my daimyo to approve me requesting it. And then I have to make sure my name is high enough so that he can't refuse it. And then I send the letter <laughs> to do it. I mean, that's that's the, that's where you'd use these formal duels. You know, that's doing this duel is the culmination of my of my life. That plot line, it's one way or another, it is going to be over. And if my character survives, then I have to essentially what that character's goals are will now completely change. And in fact, they could almost retire you know, either way. So that's what I would recommend for those, for those really formal, formal duels for, for campaigns. And that's kind of for a, for a player character yeah, one. For a player character yeah. one. Or, you know, you could say you have a whole campaign that's set around the environment of somebody else's formal duels happening and you're politicking around it and you find people who's going to cheat or impact all that, all that stuff. That that's that's a that's a worthwhile adventure related to a formal duel. That's not your player in the formal duel. If that makes yeah, sense. you could you could have this kind of feeling of impending doom, because you know if if you're doing your samurai movie right, then in many ways whoever wins the duel is kind of bad. It's you know it's it's a tragedy. Either way. The best one, certainly. But it's inevitable. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, it's a tragedy either way, and there's impending doom because you kind of, it's like watching a car crash in slow motion and you wish you could stop it, but you really can't. And all you can do is kind of do your best and uh, help whoever, you know, whoever counts as, as being on your side, you help them as best you can. But in the end, it will just come down to those two. One way or the other, you could have a. I think you, yeah, you could genuinely do a whole campaign that is just from the beginning of the deal to the end. Yes, and that's what I recommend for the these very uh, these formal duels and and kind of what the Kakita rules are for. And yes, the crane use this sort of thing a lot, but that doesn't mean they're doing it every week. It means they're setting up situations where you know this this could do it. But that's not the only kind of duels. So no, a kind of a subset of the formal duel is the judicial or legal duel. And that's a very specific to rock game thing. Um, this is the kind of trial by combat equivalent, which I don't, I mean, I, I actually, that's, it's a very Western medieval thing as far as I'm aware. I don't know if it, it, it really appearing anywhere else. I kind of, I don't think this is actually why, but it's, uh, I have an excuse for, in law for why it's a thing in Rocket Game. I think it was purely, well, I, I think it's, a, it's purely there because when they're originally making the game, they just assumed that trial by combat was a thing universally. And so they put in trial by combat. And also that possibly they just wanted to have deals as a big important thing in the card game. My theory that, that explains it is it's based off the original tournament of the Kami. Like, pretty much the very first thing the Kami do after they fall from heaven, and they, they wander about a bit, and, and they kind of, oh, who are these people? And, oh, what's going on? And it's like, okay, how do we sort out who's in charge? And they have a series of sword fights. And logically, it, it kind of immediately, you kind of think, well, maybe that's why a sword fight can determine the outcome of a legal case. You know, that, that kind of makes a bit of sense. So that, that's kind of what they're invoking. Yeah. And it gets reinforced with, uh, the tournament for the Emerald Champion, which in universe makes perfect sense because originally the, the Emerald Champion, their job was if the Emperor actually got challenged to a duel. And one can only assume that right back in the beginning, this is a thing they thought could happen. Like, you wouldn't do it today in 1123. You wouldn't be challenging the emperor. But in year five, or whenever the original tournament of the Emerald Champion came along, that they, they thought, oh, yeah, this could happen. Someone could challenge him. He need, we need someone. Who do we want? We want the best sword fighter. So we'll have a tournament. And that even, like, in 1123, that tradition is still there, even though the Emerald Champion probably is never going to be a literal champion for the emperor they still end up with a, with a deal. And so you can imagine that kind of permeating the culture as a whole. This is clearly how we sort things. 
because that's how we've been doing it since literally the gods fell from heaven. That sounds like a, a good good reason why it, why it would occur. Um, in general, I try to think of it okay, uh, like uh, a civil court. In every culture, there there end up being differences between two parties that are not um, able to be resolved, uh, you know, just by the laws. The laws don't capture everything, and the the more the the younger the society, I should say, the fewer fewer laws that there are going to be to cover circumstances where there could be a conflict, right? And societies like to stack on more and more laws so that there's less and less chances of conflict. Well, the, the, the problem is, as you, as I think actually you might be going the wrong way, like the more laws there are, the more, more laws that might apply, and so the more you need to argue about which laws apply exactly. Well, I, so I, I think it's kind of a it, constant. It, 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 it's a combination. <laughs> Because people look to laws to protect them, all right, and their property and their person and and so on. And sometimes there's not a law that covers this area of disagreement. Um, sometimes there is. In any event, especially when there is no law that covers that area of disagreement, you end up with two people with contesting claims on a truth, like – I I own that cow. You you think you own that cow? There's just one cow. What are we going to do? Um, and and if not just uh, is there law, but are there any independent witnesses? And there might not be. And so you only have the two people who are directly c- connected. So now you've got these two people arguing over cow. There's nobody else. There's not even necessarily a a, a judge who can oversee it and way between the two. Uh, no Solomon involved. So in a uncivilized society, the strongest one beats up the weaker one and takes the cow. I yes. mean, that's, there was never a lawsuit in the first place. There was never a lawsuit in the first place. <laughs> they disagree on the cow. The the stronger one beats up the other and takes the cow and it's it's done. And, you know. um, so if you want to have a chance that's when you start adding mediation, a judge or somebody weighing between it. But if there is no mediation, you still have the stronger one, you know, takes it from the weaker one until you can then find a way to figure out who is the stronger one, but allow the weaker one to pick a champion for them. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, this, this is clearly something that wouldn't happen at the very low level. This wouldn't be about cows, I have to say. This would definitely be you know, I own this huge swath of land, uh, but the river has moved. So now we need to decide who owns that bit of river. Yeah, it's no, it's going to be nobles versus nobles. Cause it, that's going to be the point where it's like you're rich enough to have someone fight for you. <laughs> but yeah, possibly, possibly at, at, at low levels. But yeah. In any event, there is a dispute between two parties. All right. And that dispute, rather than becoming warfare, between conflicting families and clans, you are resolving it, which is what you really want to avoid. You're changing it to a fight between two individuals that determines it. Okay, so if the stronger one just beats up the weaker one with no context and the weaker one runs off and gets all of his friends and then they go back and they beat up the stronger one and then he gets his friends and suddenly you have war, okay? Yeah, and the cow probably gets killed and that was a waste of time. Even if this isn't something that was formed from the Tournament of the Kami, which I think is a great in, in world explanation, the idea of turning it into one on one combat rather than side versus side combat with everybody in the society recognizing that the outcome of the one on one combat determines the truth makes sense. Because it keeps the violence to just two people rather than their whole families. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think it's very much uh, that kind of thing. And it may well be that the tournament, the Kami, is not actually the first time that came up. It's not beyond the realms of possibility when when they like Seppun, the actual the actual Seppun said, 
uh, look, if you want to sort this out, we have a tradition. It's just that everyone remembers the tournament of the Kami as the first one, because that's the first one that got written down. So that so it could have been like, yeah, you're quite right, it could have been part of the culture way back when, but the tournament of the Kami would probably be the thing that everyone references. Right. That's, that's the story. And then, so now you've got it instead of one uh, many versus many, you have it one versus one. And that's good. And now you can take it a step further and say, okay, you have a beef with this person who is weak. I'm going to champion this person that is is weak. So now you have a beef with me. And so that ends up with the idea of champions. You don't hire a champion. At least I don't think you started out by hiring a champion. You can have a champion who's your family member or your, you know, somebody who, you know, thinks your cause is just who's going to stand in for you. And now they're, you know, pick on someone your own size here. Yeah. And then later it becomes formalized, especially with the samurai and especially with Shigenja. Exactly. Because, you know, we we don't want them getting into fights. So we are going to have an official thing where they never duel. They have an official Yojibo. Here you go. There is a another aspect to the, the formal judicial duel, which is someone who is losing a court case. Because by 1123, I think we're very much in the, there is loads of laws and it's more about which laws apply and so on and so on. I think that uh, the other way of, of framing a judicial duel is someone trying to make it into an insult. You have insulted me. I demand satisfaction. And so while that isn't necessarily straight up, whoever wins this was right in the first place, it is still a way of determining guilt and innocence because you're kind of saying, well, obviously, if they were true, what they said was true, they'd have won the duel. But you have to kind of frame it to make it like a personal insult. So then you can have a personal duel. Uh, so this whole idea of having a champion step in to decide a, a matter, okay, rather than having them fight over it. Okay. So now what you have in Rokugan is what I've said very commonly, I think here on this show and elsewhere. What a duelist is is an attorney. It's a person who argues a point of view, a case with steel rather than with with words to handle these these conflicts. So a professional duelist works the same way as a, as an attorney would. So a courtier can choose to hire an attorney that will go fight for them. Um but a bunch of oppressed villagers can appeal to a duelist and say, please take our case against this be mean person who is being mean to us. And if the duelist takes the case, then they can duel on behalf. And that, there's samurai movies on that topic we've certainly seen. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's, it, it, it's generally in the, in the samurai movies, because there isn't a judicial dueling thing, it is more like they literally fight. But yeah, it's not, it's not that far off. It's probably very close to the British justice system where there's an interesting tweak. Cause I've, I've obviously, I've seen a lot of American legal shows, but the British legal show, British legal system, you have your solicitor who is most like your attorney and they do all the legal stuff. They do all the, they do all the form filling and they, they, they're all about knowing the law and stuff. But you need to have a specialized person to actually argue in court called a barrister. Oh, okay. Yes, the guy who's got the wig and the robes on, that's a whole separate person to the person who's been looking up your legal case and doing research and interviewing people and all that kind of stuff. The barrister is a whole separate person to stand up in court and argue. That sounds very like it. And a duelist is kind of like that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so actually that works great as an analogy. What you were saying about twisting it to an insult, that is great. Because it is very rare that an accusation against somebody for doing a crime, something that's like legitimately a crime, murder or something, there are laws against it and so on. Uh, you can't just say, I didn't do it. That's an insult that you accused me of that crime. 
let's fight. That's not how it, that's not how dueling in the case of a legal matter goes. Okay. It's more along the lines of this person here says he saw me sneaking out of the bedroom at midnight. Yeah. And I say, I was not sneaking out of the bedroom at midnight. I was down the hallway with so-and-so. All right? So that couldn't have been me. He saw someone else. Now you have a point of truth. Who do you believe more? This person or that person? Okay? And that's where that's where that whole we've talked about this in regards to justice, the whole status perception thing goes. Yeah. All right. But what if you have two people who are equal status saying different things? All right. Mm. Now that's where you get the 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 the, the minor point, the, the 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 key the key point uh, where you have two things that are wrong, and if one is to be right, the other one has to be wrong. Does that make sense? Between people who are equal. At that point, you're stuck. And that's where the duel can occur. You do have to have that concept that the heavens will intervene right. to make the right person win, which historically was not a thing in the East, as far as I'm aware, but it was in certain times in the, in the West. But given we've got the example of like the original Tournament of the Kami and stuff like that, that could well be part of Rock again. Yep. And I, and I use this for people, every, every party occasionally has a murder hobo. Or, <laughs> you know, if you have players, or if you are players, who end up where it thinks like, oh, I'll just fight my way out of this. It's not that, or I'll just fight to prove my case. I don't need evidence. I don't need witnesses. I don't, I'll just say it's so and. That's not quite how it works. You have to find that one point where two people of similar rank, or at least vouched for similar rank, it, it could be a peasant, but somebody else is vouching for them, says completely contradicting things. And you have to figure out which one is true. Basically, I think it is possible that you, you know, the, the strategy can be to frame it as how dare you, that's an insult, dueling, but it's still a skill. Mm -hmm. it's still you've got to manipulate things it's not as simple as saying you said you said one thing i said another that you know that could work that way but if you want to try and try and whizzle out of it by making it a, a point of honor that's a skill right you have to find the lie i guess i guess that's yes you have to find the lie it can't just be you accused me I didn't, I'm going to duel you over it. That would be too easy for a good duelist then to get off of everything. And it doesn't work that way. Um, <laughs> the duelist has to also be bright enough to find the point that is the lie. Yeah, to force it to be a direct personal insult, as opposed to a statement of fact. Somehow make, it th make that the issue. Right. And that's not necessarily going to be easy. That's going to take some, some skill. So it's, it's kind of, I don't know. Uh, it, it, it's just not quite as straightforward as sometimes it, it might seem when we say duels re resolve judicial matters. It's not it's over points of difference. But that's not the only kind of duel there are either. There's more kinds of duels. <laughs> yeah. So there's a thing that I decided to put down, which is recreational and training duels. You may or may not um, roll these out. You know, they may not be... Oh, but roll necessary. them out fun. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, that, I mean, that would, that's really the reason to do it. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's have a duel, and we'll run it exactly as if it's a horrible lethal death duel, but it's all with blunted weapons. And so by the end of it, you know, if I've, if I've delivered the permanent wound crit to someone, that's when the sensei goes, well, that was an excellent duel. You would have suffered a permanent wound. You needed to work on your training. And no one actually dies. And it could also just be for the pure fun of it. And, you know, let's, 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 you know, whack some, you know, some bokken together for a bit. That'll be fun. And the players get to roll some dice and things like that. And you could even use it as part of a training montage, you know, that kind of thing, where like literally the PC is saying, I want to learn the techniques. So they go back to their sensei and you kind of say, okay, we're going to roll a duel. And that can be maybe part of it, part of the whole process. So the idea is here that no one's going to die. It's for training. 
or it's just for entertainment or it could be for betting. That's another thing, another possibility. And that sort of thing could be a little informal contest. You know, who's going to do the washing up? Well, we're going to have a little tournament to determine. The loser has to do the washing up, that kind of thing. Uh, we've definitely not lived in places like that. No, that's that's never happened. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't, we didn't use Bokken, I will point out, but, you know, still. Um, you could also, having, you know, so, so it can be all very, very, you know, within the context of a training thing. It could be if you're playing, you know, children who are going to go on to be adventurous later, but you, you're kind of doing a flashback or something. So there's a bunch of reasons for doing those. Uh, as a plot point, one of them turning lethal could be a plot point. But the general idea is it's not lethal. So if I was, at, we'll get more into mechanics in our next foray into duels. But if you were going to have a duel, for example, to cut the sleeve of your opponent, they've got those nice hanging sleeves. That's a very common um, live steel thing. You can say, it is. There's nothing. That's a zero strength forbidding anyone right, from saying it, it, it's a it's GM a parameter. It, not every duel has to is gonna has to risk death. Just the not every duel has to risk death. Just the GM could say that this this kind of duel doesn't. So you don't have to worry that it will only get uh, zero. Yeah, you only get lethal. Yeah, I mean, and so you could even say like, doesn't matter what lethal. What you, know, you get, you get your finishing blow, and you're doing like a. Was it 14 with a katana or something? Right. She put some ridiculous number. You could state that because the purpose was to do the sleeve cutting, then your super terrifying crit, that's what it does. It just does it very convincingly because that's the, that's the, the aim of your character. So that's what it's all about. You could also do the uh, who gets the last dumpling and you do it with dual rules. Why not? But it's done with chopsticks. Yeah, you do a chopstick is your weapon, and the winner who gets a crit is yeah. the dumpling. You know, it, it doesn't have to be. Exactly. You know, I think there's a whole bunch of those possibilities, yeah. Basically, the GM sets the rules. And if you want to have the risk of death, then you can, but but you don't have to as long as everybody agrees. And And like I say, there are movies in which it is a plot point where, even with Bokken, Someone in a training duel or an exhibition match, which is another thing I was forgetting the possibility of. Yeah, like you get your students together and you, it's all, you know, non lethal, but you're training, you're demonstrating your school skill against another. It's a plot point where someone is still acting lethally when no one else is. And that, that can have big ramifications. So that can also be part of the, the, how you use that in a game. Another kind of duel that happens, so we've talked about formal and judicial and recreational or training duels. The The next kind is probably the most common actual duels um, I've seen in campaigns, which is the impromptu duels. Uh, you are not in an area that is strictly controlled. It's you, me, outside. Yeah. Uh, that's literally what just happened a couple of sessions ago in the game monthly. Right. So when does this happen? If both parties are clan samurai, especially if they are, well, even if they are uh, same clan samurai or conflicting, and they have some status and rank, you do not have permission from your lord to immediately call out and go do a duel to the death with another clan samurai. Yeah, you do not. No, that's very naughty behavior. That's not going to be approved. However. <laughs> yeah, especially duel to death. But that doesn't mean you don't go out and duel to the beat the hell out of. Um, well, it, it must be said that, that you know, Rogan is a world where there is war. War does happen. And in a world like that, yeah, sometimes people whose job it is to be good at hitting people with swords. When they get angry, they tend to want to hit people with swords. And again, this is that thing of at least this contains it. And so your lord's probably going to be quite annoyed with you, but it is reasonably likely that they go, was it a fair fight? Right, fair enough then. You know, slap on the wrist, um, you're on KP for the next 
week or whatever. You know, it's, it's reasonably unlikely to be taken as murder, even if technically speaking. And this is the thing that, again, I'm, I'm thinking of Western analogies, that there's lots of periods of time in Western history where dueling was technically speaking completely illegal, but that was never prosecuted if it was a fair fight. Everyone just kind of went, you know, fair. You know, if, if we didn't have this kind of dueling outlet, then it would just be murder and, and ambush and we don't want that. So, you know, we disapprove. <laughs> mm. Right. But, you know, it's, it's, yeah, as bad as, as it only gets as bad as like, well, you shouldn't do that again. Naughty. Unless it's someone very famous and important and they get upset. <laughs> so what are the circumstances where it would be okay? If you are a Ronin fighting another Roman, it's fine. You're going to be able to inform. No one cares about you enough to do it. If you're a clan samurai fighting a Ronin, especially if you win, no one cares. Yes. <laughs> they, they, get, they might get upset if you die. Might well get upset with a Ronin. Yeah. If you are a clan samurai fighting another samurai and you are 100% sure that that clan samurai's lord would not be happy with what that clan samurai was doing, you're probably fine. <laughs> you really probably are fine because you, you know, it might start an incident, but as you said, be a slap on the wrist. And, and the less lethal the dual conditions, the more likely you get away with it. Obviously, dual to the death is kind of always the riskiest, you know, even if you win, right? That's the one where you, you most likely are going to get consequences. You might not. And it is going to, like you say, it depends on what did that guy say to you? And it's like, oh, oh, no, no, you couldn't have stood that. No, fair enough. Right. But everyone's much more lenient is, did you whack him in the head until he went, oh, you know, my bad, I'm sorry. <laughs> no one's going to complain about that, you know. But, but like, did you take the head off? Ooh, we're going to have to have a chat about that. If the opponent that you're facing uh, is acting as an agent of their lord, now you're going to have a problem. But if you think that their lord would disavow them because they were incredibly rude and they shouldn't have been and their lord would not approve, yada, yada, yada. Now he's like, oh, well, his lord would probably have wanted him dead anyway. So I just was the agent of his being dead. You think about the courtier who has to argue it in court afterwards. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And and it, again, another big difference is who asked for it, who demanded the duel. Yeah, because that's a that's a big thing. Because if you get challenged, well, you can't say no, can you? Right. You know, in that situation, that that would be against kind of the public expectations of what it is to be. A warrior can't exactly say no, can you? That's very different from you challenging someone. So it's all, it's all a bit, um, and also some people, honestly, in the moment, they just don't care. They're just that angry. Right. So, but if you are the one who just got that angry, uh, and, uh, called a jewel on another clan samurai who isn't doing anything that their lord would disavow, <laughs> Then you need to have an excuse for your anger. You are in the wrong, basically. Even if they insulted you, you are in, even if they insulted you, you are in the wrong because people could debate the amount of, of, um, insult, basically. You can't just say he insulted me and it, it takes some minor thing and blow it up to, I, I will kill him. Uh, unless, you know, unless there's, the insult was so bad that the Lord would be embarrassed to have that out there. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. One of the, the things about L5R as a whole is it is a game where there are social consequences to your actions. We can't just say, well, of course I could do that. The rules say I can. It's like, no, well, there's, there's people, people will treat you based on what you do, so be cautious. So technically, uh, in the duel with... Yoritomo versus uh, Miramoto Satsume. Satsume? Uh, uh, Hitomi's brother, right? Um, 
Yakimo versus Yakimo. Not Yoritomo. It's not Yoritomo. Yakimo. Hide Yakimo versus Hitomi's brother. That was a duel, but the insult that Yakimo blew up was very egregious and uh, the way he behaved in it. And so even though it was legal-ish, because he was the son of a sam- clan samurai, a, cl- a clan champion, he got lots of bad social consequences because of that. He was definitely not good overall. No. Um, anyway, so impromptu duels. Um, we kind of talked about those. There's lots of times you can use these. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, they can, you know, like, they can crop up if, as a way of stopping conflict. If there's a bad guy running in, and you kind of, well, I'm going to stop you, and that can be a duel, that can be that kind of impromptu thing, yeah. Yeah, I think that uses the most taking out the bad guy. Absolutely, uh, yeah. That's, that's why it's like, the Lord, in general, their champion is not going to want to defend somebody who is being evil, so you can use this as a way of taking out the evil person. Now, the next one I wrote down, this is one I added, uh, assassination. Now, at the risk of... Uh, annoying my podcast partner, <laughs> I will bring up the notion that the assassins of the crane are, are the Kakita, which has been Grr. bandied about. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, that is a thing that people do do. The, 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 the crane and the scorpion and a few others get someone into a situation where they get angry and they declare a duel and then, ah, oh, we shall, my champion is the bestest duelist ever. Oh no, you're in tr- you know, that kind of thing. That is a thing, but that's really more honestly in the formal duel, judicial duel kind of. As- yeah, that's that's in that realm, right? Um, so that's kind of taken up. That's that's trying to manipulate the formal duel and the the legal duel such that someone you want dead ends up dead. What I'm thinking of here with this kind of assassination is. Instead of, so if someone gets hired to assassinate in this, probably a player character in this case. Otherwise, why, why are we concerned? <laughs> but it could also be, you know, this is what you're trying to stop. And the assassin, they the way they do it is they literally just stroll up to the person in question and they say, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you right now. And then they do. And I, that's a really classic trope. And this is the assassin with their internal code of honor. So, you- Co- code of honor or arrogance. <laughs> they can it, 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 sometimes both, but sometimes it's, they're just so arrogant. Right. That, yeah, of course I can kill them. You know, but but yes, either of those two, like the the assassin that's just so arrogant, or the assassin who's actually honestly has a code of honor, and those those could be just delicious characters. Right to play. And also just send after your PCs. Yes, yes. Both of them can be just, just so much fun. So so basically, no, this would be a Ronin or potentially a Scorpion. I don't think of any, uh, any. well, I don't know. I suspect they'd be pretending to be a Ronin, even if they were actually a Scorpion. <laughs> yeah. So this would be a very small subset of people who would be either, uh, who could be in a clan doing a... They could be in, I, I can think of most clans that they would be in, but they would be, know that they would be utterly disavowed for it. And they would be doing what needed to be done if they were doing under champions, or they would have forsaken their vows temporarily uh, of loyalty to pursue a private vendetta. It does change whether or not the clans are at war. If they're straight up at war and there's a situation where, like, you know, you, if you've got Ota Sanuchi or, or Yoko Rari, where there are lots of different clans all in one place and two clans are at war, it actually, someone, a, an actual clan samurai could just wander up and say, I'm going to kill you because that's part of the war that we're in. But that's a kind of very specific set of circumstances. Most of the time, there's going to be some kind of plausible deniability, like you say. Or, or like I said, they're on a they're on a private vendetta. So, uh, you killed my family. I am going to kill you now. Here, yes. And I, I, I have my honor, but I'm going to do it right now. I can't, I can't prove it. I can't, um, I can't do a formal duel about it. You've got higher status or whatever it is. 
Um, yeah, I mean the the I'm gonna the kill you. very yeah the very traditional blood feud from from samurai fiction is we know who killed the the you know your father. Uh, we can't bring them to justice for whatever reason. And in Rock Again, it could be they're from another clan and we don't have extradition powers. And the, yeah, in the Edo period, they're actually like, you have a, you have a piece of paper that says you are, it is perfectly fine for you to wander up to this individual and try and kill them. It, that will be legal. And that, that could be a situation. Right. So then it could be a clan samurai who's doing it. It's just that their champion has disavowed their, their actions. You know, or whoever sent them is like, I have no control over what he is doing. He, I am not responsible. He is going off on his own to pursue justice for his parents. They are technically Ronin until they do this. Right. And that, that's, that's come up. And then it's there. It's not a, I am sending you to go assassin. It's like, you have a beef. I agree with your beef. I can't do it. So you are disavowed unless you're successful and like no one finds out. And and so in some cases, I mean, it's been a plot point in at least one drama that I've seen where it's like, you are basically a Ronin until you do this because avenging your father is such an important part of the society that until you do it, you are not fit to serve me. So you have, you are now going to be Ronin until you accomplish this. And that sounds like a great no. way to do it. That's a great plot. A great story. I, I think that's a really cool kind of visual, the whole kind of, I'm here to kill you, and they, then you start a duel. That's great. <laughs> the last kind of common duel that you are going to have um, is a is a battlefield duel. Um, so this is, you're fighting in a greater skirmish or a warfare, and two people lock eyes and they're going to duel it. They're going to call each other out and we're going to, you and me, we're going to fight now. And we're going to duel on the battlefield. And there are all kinds of special rules for for that in the books. And that one's talked about a lot more. So we can talk about the rules for that again when we get more uh, more mechanical. But it's just a subset of a bigger fight where two people agree that they're going to fight each other. And that's when you really get into that. It's It's a special thing because you can imagine now the camera is focused just on these two while the battle as a whole is raging on in the background. But this is this is the dramatic moment for this for right now. And that's that's when it becomes a clash. Now for all of these duels, if they are Shiginja, they could be doing them as Taru Jie, which is the Shiginja duels. And Shiginja duels could be either blasting each other with big elemental effects or summoning up their avatars and fighting each other. All of these can work for Shiginja using that in the same way. But Shiginja, if they're losing their temper and just going off, are not being very good Shiginja. No, and, and I've got to say that, that you, one of the reasons why there's a dual culture like we were talking about is to contain the violence. So it's instead of like a whole family versus another family, you don't want that. So it becomes between two people. With a Shigenja, it's even worse because it's like the devastation of unrestrained fighting Shigenja is like a broken landscape or a city that's on fire. You don't want that. So try, if, if there does need to be some kind of conflict between Shigenja, you don't want the violence to be unrestrained because the sheer amount of damage they can do. And then you get into also we don't want these incredibly rare people with this incredible power to just get killed a lot. That seems a bad idea. And so, yeah, you get into the Tariu GI. And so you got, you got, got those, you know, just, just blast each other in this kind of, I, I believe they set up some kind of thing where you're like, it's in this little bubble. So it doesn't extend outside. And then you have the make your champions and basically have a rock and sock and robot fight. And there's the thing we saw in the fiction uh, was it, uh, oh, what is the name? Forgiveness doesn't come first. Yes, I can't remember the that's name, of, the name it. of it. Yes, I remembered. Cause that, that was a kind of interesting, slightly different one as well. Cause you come, you, you rock up with your mini shrine with your kami in it. And I, and then the conflict works around those two, around that. So there's, 
I, I would, we don't really have many formal rules for it for the Tarot UGI, which is, I think is a shame. No, but you can kind of think that all of these duels, while we say any any one of these kinds of duels can be done by Shigenja, it has to be Shigenja versus Shigenja, right? It's not going to be Shigenja versus, uh, or, and Shigenja are supposed to be much more restrained on this sort of thing. So if you had a Shigenja who was calling a duel for any reason, except the most important, they're going to get a lot of a sconce. It's not going to be, it's not going to be the same as if warriors are. Absolutely. It's got to be so bad that even risking someone as rare as a Shigenja is okay. And that's not going to happen that often. Possibly what you could do is do like we were talking about with the recreational training duels is, you know, until we get some like formal Tariu GI rules, just roll the dice as normal using dueling rules with the stare down and all that kind of stuff. Just use the rules as, as per normal. Like, so you might be actually casting spells at each other or something like that. And at the end, we will say, Oh, you, you know, the person who gets immolated according to the rules, everyone goes, Oh, well, okay. You're the one who lost then. And then in fact, no one's taken any damage because it's all been in some way simulated yeah or you do the full rules but instead of trying to immolate each other it's like who who gets to light the candle yes exactly so you're two people staring across a table with a candle in the middle and who's teeny tiny fire kami gets to light the candle well they're going to wrestle it out and you know one of them will light the candle and they win even if you're using rules that would normally be people exploding what is actually happening is who lights the candle or, you know, who is able to give power to the, this earth kami in a shrine or whatever it is, you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That. Anyway, so we've talked for a while about this. Um, we've tried to cover the, you know, a bunch of different kinds of duels and when you might want to use them in a, a campaign, uh, some scenarios uh, where it would come up that you might, include it's not necessarily everything that is to do with a duel um like before and after and setting up but there's a lot to talk about yeah duels are very big so maybe that's more topics to work on but i think we've taught more than enough today (laughs) i think we have i think we've no i think we've covered a lot and i think there's a lot of food for thought in there okay so i think this is a topic we're going to come back to i think but that's it for today Yep. So I wanted to give a call out to Fortune and Strife, our affiliated actual play guest, which hopefully is coming back very, very soon. So keep your ears out for that. Our content is funded by the Community Discord Patreon, which supports our editing costs, as well as our website where you can store and see longer term information. But as a heads up, it reached maximum capacity for July. So you have to wait until August 1st before you can go back there. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> so it's possible that by the time you listen to this, it's back up. Uh, but we, we have been a victim of our own success and managed to get too many people visiting mm-hmm. in July. So oops. Uh, for our Patreons, we do try to have special bonus content like Adventure Seeds, early access to Fortune and Strife. So as I said, that's coming back. And other things as we think about them. Online, you can usually find us at our website, courtgamespod.com. On Twitter, which is still ongoing, so that's fine. <laughs> we are twitter.com slash courtgamespod. And you can find us on Patreon if you want to support us and what we do. Our Patreon is at patreon.com slash courtgames. But that's it for this week. This is Kikita Kaori. May the fortunes favor you. And I have been Korva. And until we meet again, keep your jade handy.
with the correct amount. D20 Radio, where gamers roll. www.d20radio.com